Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Dr. Gerardo Ceballos. He is one of the world's leading ecologists and is a professor at the Institute of Ecology at National Autonomous University of Mexico. He's the author of numerous books, including The Skin of the Rainforest, Mammals of Mexico, and The Annihilation of Nature, Human Extinction of Birds and Mammals. He's also known for his fieldwork on prairie dogs, jaguars, and others. He proposed the first Mexican Endangered Species Act that includes roughly 4,000 species of plants and animals. He's seen through to establishment more than 20 protected areas that cover almost 2% of the Mexican land territory to protect thousands of plants and animals, including around 15% of all endangered species. And it's, it's true to say that no other Mexican scientist, perhaps no other individual scientist in the world has accomplished so much hands-on conservation. So I am deeply honored to have you on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much to uh, have this opportunity to talk to you and your audience. Um, so today, um, one of the things I would like to talk about is the prairie dog as a keystone species. You were either one of the people or the person to actually start promoting that idea. So can you tell me, first can you tell the story of how you were um, driving across an area and saw a lush field of grass and what that had to do with prairie dogs? Yes, uh, well, thank you. Uh, well, in, uh, uh, I am a malogist and an ecologist and uh, I was doing my PhD at the University of Arizona in the uh, uh, late, 1980s, and I was one day reading about prairie dogs in Mexico and the southwestern U.S., and the uh, species has basically, basically become extinct on those places, and I was intrigued that there has been no records from Mexico for many years. Nobody has been looking for them. So uh, one day I was going to drive from uh, uh, Arizona to Mexico City, and I decided to take my car. At that time, it was a Renault. I mean, a car wasn't obviously not uh, appropriate for doing field work. But anyway, I took the car and I took my wife and we went and, and tried to look out for uh, the prairie dogs in Chihuahua, Mexico. Chihuahua is a state that borders uh, New Mexico. So we went there. One um, uh, morning, we uh, set up driving from Tucson. Uh, we crossed the border and we keep on going. And we eventually uh, reached a city called Janos, a small city called Janos in Mexico, in northern Chihuahua. And from there, I start to ask people if they will know anything about prairie dogs. And most of them say, well, there are some around and so on. So I was very excited. And eventually, uh, we start to drive into a grassland. It was a, the most amazing grassland I have ever seen at that time because it was, you basically will lose your uh, sight in the horizon and there were grasslands. So we start to drive there in a dirt road, and after uh, like one hour in the dirt road, suddenly we make a curve and enter what was the most amazing sight I have ever seen in terms of the prairie dogs. It was a colony that at that time extended for 55,000 hectares. It's more than 120,000 acres continuously. So it was uh, getting late at that time. It was like uh, as five-ish in the afternoon. So I drive like for two hours, uh, find a place to camp, and we camp in there. And the next morning, we keep on uh, driving around. And it was just an amazing thing because we saw uh, thousands and thousands of prairie dogs. So we have rediscovered what at that time was the largest prairie dog colony left on Earth. And uh, the site was really, really unbelievable. And, and is there a relationship between the um, grasslands that you were seeing and the prairie dogs? So we, we, when we were there uh, at that time, the idea, there was a very, very widespread idea that prairie dogs were a pest that would compete with cattle and they, they destroyed the grassland and then there has been uh, campaigns. I mean, in the USA were, were campaigns paid by the government to exterminate prairie dogs. And uh, they were they, ha they, they were very successful campaigns, eradication campaigns. And uh, in the 1990s, they have uh, prairie dogs have already been disappeared from 98 percent of the ranges. Uh, so, so the species, although was uh, locally common in a few places, it has basically vanished for most of the uh, uh, North America. 
Originally, prey dogs were found from uh, uh, Canada, from southern Canada, all of, through the Great Plains in the U.S. to northern Mexico. So when I saw that that incredibly sight in, uh, of the prey dogs and, and uh, the grasslands and all this wildlife that I saw in Mexico, it occurred to me that uh, if the prey dogs were really a pest and were really damaging the grasslands, I wouldn't be able to see the grasslands that I was uh, looking at at that time in Mexico. So, so to make this story uh, short, what we, I decided to, first of all, do some studies with, my, with uh, some friends to find out how big was this colony. And at that time is when I realized that prey dog had been lost in 98% of the range on the one hand, but also that this Mexican colony was uh, uh, the largest left on earth. And, Wait, uh, can, can we back up for a second? Yeah. And you, you mentioned, can you talk a little bit more about what prairie dogs might have been like prior to the conquest of this continent by Europeans? Because you did say they went all the way to Canada. Like, do we have any idea what may have been the largest individual um, yeah. community of prairie dogs? And can you give some numbers? Like, we know there were 60 million bison. So how many prairie dogs? Do we, do we even know? Or like, I've read, okay, I did a talk in San Francisco last fall, and before I went there, I looked up what San Francisco, what the early European explorers described San Francisco. They said that the, the bay was paved with sea lions, and they said that there were so many whales that sometimes the air stunk, because evidently whales have pretty bad breath. Yes, yes. So no, no, that's, that's can, a good point. I will, I will uh, let you know that. So, so um, well, I, and... Before I go into Mexico at that time, I have uh, read the uh, earlier accounts of prey dog, their abundance, and so on. And for instance, uh, across the Mexico-U.S. border, uh, when they were uh, putting up the new uh, border between the two countries, there was this uh, scientist, uh, Edward Mertz, who was able to see a, a colonies there that extended more than 20 kilometers long. And it was... It was, uh, let's, let's uh, remind the audience that the, this part of Mexico and the U.S., southwestern U.S., is the southern limit of the prairie dogs in the continent. But then I also learned uh, that uh, uh, in the in, uh, early 1800s, there were colonies. I mean, there were colonies with uh, uh, 400 million prairie dogs. I mean, just one, one colony is supposed to have 400 million prairie dogs. Uh, although I don't know how accurate the, those, those uh, numbers are, what I can tell you is that when we rediscovered the, the place in Mexico, this just one single colony has one and a half million individuals. So it is very likely that the 400 million uh, colony that was described in the late 1800s in Texas, uh, going north to the, to, to, to the central U.S., was very feasible that there will be so so so, so large number of, of animals. So prairie dogs, in that sense, uh, uh, were one of the most abundant uh, uh, medium-sized mammals on Earth. And uh, let's remember that prairie dogs are more or less like like a, a little bit more than a, a one pound, one and a half pound animal, and uh, um, they they live in these colonies who are uh, loosely c connected. But basically, these are squirrel, squirrels that are related to the squirrel family. And uh, those animals are uh, basically living in these colonies. They, when you see the grassland, you see the grassland dotted with small holes, and the prey dogs live on those holes. So, I mean, probably, probably there will be mean, uh, billions of prey dogs uh, when the first uh, uh, Westerners colonized uh, uh, North America. Uh, unfortunately, those, those, those sites are gone, but just to give you an idea, then when I was there in Mexico thinking about uh, how these animals could uh, change the environment and looking at the grassland dot with prairie dogs, so it didn't, it didn't make sense to me that these animals were a pest, were causing damage to the environment. So being a scientist, what I decided to do, first of all, is like a measure and evaluate how many animals there were in Mexico. And at that time, we find out that the colony has, like, as I said before, 120, 130,000 acres. It was a huge colony. And we estimate the, the population there 
and we um, came out with a one one and a half million prairie dogs at that time there. So so they were very very abundant and they were very uh, in a very large uh, colony. Then what we did is like uh, uh, set aside a series of experiments to try to find out what was the impact of the prairie dogs. And I will uh, mention a little bit more details in, in a minute, but uh, to make uh, what we find out is that prairie dogs were not only, uh, not only a pest for the uh, grassland, these animals were basically the driving force to keep grasslands alive. But what, what we found is like prairie dogs with their, with their uh, um, uh, behavior, with their uh, foraging behavior, for instance, they destroy the scrubs that invade the grasslands and uh, keep the grasslands as a, as a uh, ecosystem because they, they need to, to, to look at for predators. Let's remember that uh, being so abundant and being relatively big animals, they are prey upon by coyotes, badger, eagles, and a lot of animals. So they, they have to be all the time looking out, uh, trying to defend themselves and trying to find out the predators. So they don't like to say, to put it in that way, they don't like to see shrubs that uh, uh, don't allow them to, to see the horizon because that's the way they can protect themselves against predators. So what they do is they, 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 they nibble and they destroy the uh, scrubs. And the scrubs in this particular part of the, of the continent, this is a semi-harid grassland, those scrubs put aside by an animal like prey dogs eventually invade the grasslands and those grasslands turn into a, into a more uh, desert-like vegetation where mesquites and other scrubs become the abundant plants and the grasslands are gone. So what we discovered with our, our, our studies is that prey dogs are basically what we call, what scientists call a keystone species. And a keystone species is a species who has an impact in its environment much larger than you will expect by its abundance. So, so we start to do some experiments, and this is incredibly interesting. Though. We published a paper in 1994 in Conservation Biology, the journal Conservation Biology, where we basically uh, uh, say that. We say, based on the, all the information that we, we have, we find out that prey dogs were a keystone species because basically three things. One, if they disappear, there is a lot of biodiversity associated to the colonies, like uh, uh, black-footed ferret and many, many other mammals and birds, reptiles, amphibians disappear. And second, they are incredibly important because their activities, they maintain the grassland as a, as a unit, as a ecosystem, and fending off the grasslands against desert-like plants like a mesquite crops. And third, by doing this, they are incredibly important for humans because by keeping the grasslands, they keep the capability of those ecosystems to provide environmental services, all those benefits that we humans get for free from the uh, uh, proper uh, working of the environment, like forage, water, and, and microclimate, and so on. So we, we, we put together this idea and we publish it and we say the predators were not a pest and instead they were a, a keystone species. And what was very interesting at that time is a lot of people, a lot of other scientists start to come out with more information showing that what we have said was a real, really the case, that there was a lot, a lot of information showing that predators are keystone species. And, and uh, then what we did is say, well, if there were billions of prey dogs in the landscape and now they are gone, there must be a lot of impact on that landscape. And then we start to dig out some historic records, for instance, in La Jornada region of uh, south, southern uh, New Mexico. And it was incredible, incredibly to find out that an area now covered by scrubs land and it's very desert-like place in the 1800s was covered by prey dogs grasslands, and it could maintain up to 20,000 cattle heads in an area that now can support no more than probably 100. So, so uh, uh, all this information uh, keeps uh, uh, letting us to try to understand more what was the role of prey dogs on these issues. And in the last five, uh, 10 years, what we have done is we uh, have done some studies to, to see the prey dogs compete with cattle and what is the, 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 the specific role in the environment. And what we have found is like 
uh, we have a big in enclosure, experimental enclosure in Mexico, it's like uh, 500 hectares. In, in that area, we put cattle, prey dogs, and, and in areas where there are prey dogs, and in the cattle, we put them a, a radio collar, so we know every, every four minutes where the cattle is, it is two, two cattle heads. And what we find out is like 95% of the time, cattle spend the time in the prey dog colonies <laughs> because they really like some plants that are promoted by prey dog activities and are not eaten by the prey dogs. In other words, what we found, and this is incredibly important, is that prey dogs and cattle do not compete uh, uh, for forage if they have, uh, the, uh, uh, if cattle is managed at the proper, at the proper uh, density. And not only that, cattle grows much better where there are prey dogs than where there are not prey dogs. Well, that, that would seem to make perfect sense to me since the um, prey dogs co-evolved. I mean, they ex coexisted with um, large ruminant, you know, bison. That, that's exactly, that's exactly, that's a very good point. I mean, originally there were uh, millions of, of bison and prey dogs uh, co-evolving in the same grasslands and they have this, this uh, interesting interaction. So basically when we start to, to, to have this logic for uh, doing our experiments, what we thought is like, okay, cattle at the proper densities in a grassland may behave a little bit as a bison. And so, so if the bison and the prey dog coexist, coexist, why couldn't the prey dogs and the cattle coexist? And we were very lucky to find out that they, they indeed can coexist. They indeed can, uh, bison in many of these habitats where, uh, oh, sorry, cattle in many of these habitats where, where uh, bison has been lost can be used to uh, recreate in some sense the role of, of bison. And this is what we have been doing in some of the experiments there in Mexico. And uh, I'm very, very uh, happy to tell you that using cattle at the proper densities with prey dogs, we have been able to keep a, a, a on keep on the grassland going. Even now, there has been a tremendously drought in that part of the, 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 the continent for several years. And, and uh, what is also very interesting, by keeping the cattle, you keep the livelihood of the people, obviously, but also uh, uh, cattle has uh, some important, important effects on the habitat because they drops, the droppings or their, their urine also fertilize uh, some, uh, the, the grassland. So, and, and uh, having prey dogs and cattle together and being able to manage them for nature, we have been able to keep a lot of other animals going in the same places, peccaries, deer, pronghorn antelope, and uh, black-footed ferrets, uh, and many other uh, mammals and uh, vertebrates. So you mentioned the thing about how the, um, how the plants in parts of New Mexico and other places have been affected by uh, the eradication of prairie dogs. And that reminds me of a line by uh, Simon Ortiz wrote about how when the Europeans first arrived in New Mexico, they were met with grasses that came up to their knees when they were riding on horses. And my sister lived in New Mexico, so I, I've spent some time in New Mexico, and frankly, it didn't seem like tall grass prairie anymore. It's obviously been changed pretty severely. Exactly. Well, that that's exactly right. So if you when when I was in Mexico, uh, the the grasslands that I saw there in northern Mexico in the late 1980s, it was like a, like a um, landscape of the past because most of this kind of habitat has been lost in the U.S. and in Mexico, and and uh, basically the, those areas where we are working to save the prey dogs in Mexico are. Uh, uh, really, really a, a habitat of the past, an ecosystem of the past, in the sense that most of it has been destroyed by human activities, either cattle grazing or uh, um, agriculture and all the changes that uh, are associated to these uh, large scale human activities. What is important about it is like uh, having been in, in such a, a difficult times of change, um, we humans, we are too many people on earth, we are 7.23 billion, and we are growing by 250,000 people a day. And these people has uh, 
a huge impact. All of us have a huge impact on the environment. So it is important to find to find uh, uh, examples like prairie dogs and cattle where we can manage uh, cattle for uh, providing benefits to humans and to us. But also we can uh, do good management, proper management, and keep, we can keep on going the productive activities while preserving nature. And I think this example of the prey dogs and the cattle and, and the grasslands and the wildlife in Mexico, it, it can give us some, some, first of all, some ideas that it can be done in many, in many country, in many places on earth. If we will put a, a, enough a, a research and uh, ecological research, we can end up having good uh, recipes of how to manage the habitat to couple a, a uh, development with conservation. And I think this is a, a one very important lesson from, from the Janos area in Mexico is it can be done. If it can be done in that particular area that is very st water stressed and it is in the in the borderline between the grasslands and the ar arid uh, uh, regions and so on, in many other areas who are less stressed climate in terms of the climate, it, it can it can be it can be done. The second part is like, uh, the second uh, 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 lesson for me is like, we have to do an effort to really try to understand how to do this coupling. Because we're, we're really now, now because of the population growth on the one hand, the inequities on the distribution of wealth. I mean, very rich, very rich countries and very poor countries, or very rich individuals in a country and very poor individuals in, another, in, in the same country. The consumption of our consumption patterns and the energy we use, basically uh, fossil uh, fuels, were putting too much stress on on, on our planet. And and um, having find out things like what we are we found with the prey dogs and the grasslands, it gives me hope that if we put our best bright minds on solving the uh, equation of how we humans can coexist with nature without destroying everything, I think this is one of the most important challenges in the next three or four decades. Let me tell you that I'm, I'm kind of uh, concerned that the rate of change for natural ecosystems uh, and uh, the number of uh, extinct and endangered species uh, on the one hand, and the way we're losing those environment and those species, and we're losing also the, the uh, ecosystem services that uh, nature provides for humans, I think we're putting too much stress on the uh, environment on the one hand, but that stress and that that uh, uh, particular uh, impact is causing tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, constraints on the way society is, uh, uh, our society is uh, sustained. And uh, basically all these problems, environmental problems can be easily become economic, social and political problems. Well, and of course they can, because because without a natural world, there is no society whatsoever. I mean, it's it That's always exactly it, right. it always strikes me as completely insane about this culture that it um, promotes the economic system over the natural world. Clearly not. I mean, that that's literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality, since Without a natural world, you have no life whatsoever. Well, that, that's that's a very good point because exactly, I mean, we can and humanity has gone through a really big, huge uh, uh, economic crisis and has been able to come out, and political crisis and has been able to come out properly, and social problems the same. But let's rem let, let, let's remember, as you say, that if we continue eroding the uh, uh, environmental environmental uh, uh, elements and functions that provide the conditions that make Earth suitable for life, we're really eroding, at the end, what we're, we're eroding is the capabilities of Earth to maintain human civilization as we know it. And that's my main concern. I mean, I'm, one of my major concerns is, as you said, I mean, it's incredible. It is very, very hard for me to understand why economists still don't uh, get the sense that uh, uh, resources are limited, I mean, are finite, and uh, we still do or we're uh, developing 
uh, uh, main developing uh, uh, ideas and, uh, and trends as if the uh, nature and in, in particular and uh, uh, natural resources in general were limitless. So, so basically, I think that uh, uh, going back to the prairie dogs, this model uh, ecosystem now, this model study that we have been doing in Mexico and now with, with other people in the U.S. is telling us that there are big problems uh, 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 that are destroying our ecosystems and species. Also, that uh, this can be solved with science and technology and, uh, and a sensible way to try to couple development and, and, uh, and conservation. But also, this is telling us that the window of opportunity, the window of time is really small and it's closing. Unless, and this is, I firmly believe, and I will be very responsible to say something like this, if I was, I didn't have enough uh, scientific evidence that this is occurring, I really think that we don't have more than three, three or four decades to, to really uh, 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 do a major change on the way we do things. If we want to uh, avoid us, I think your president Obama said recently to, 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 to live in a nightmare. Right now we have been, been living in a nice dream and I think I wish we can put our act together. We can work for to save nature, to save prairie dogs, uh, to save grasslands, to save uh, uh, all these uh, incredibly ecosystems where these species are. Uh, and, in, and in order to, to maintain biodiversity on earth, but if we are incredibly selfish to maintain just human, a civilization the way we know it now on earth and it, it is very important it's very important that we understand the urgency of the problem that we understand that there is no much time left and i will i will be incredibly happy if i'm proven wrong and somebody came out and showed with data that what we're saying that we are uh, 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 perceiving what we're saying that we are uh, uh, understanding based on our data scientific data is wrong I I don't see um I don't see even a prayer of all of that being wrong. I mean, wildlife in general has decreased by 50% over the last 40 years. I mean, the 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 world is collapsing. I don't know. I mean, even every year I see fewer migratory songbirds than the year before. It's this is it doesn't matter where you are, the world is really collapsing. It really doesn't matter, as you say it. And, and, and let me tell you, tell you something. We just published re published recently a, a paper in, in in the journal Science Advances, and and uh, basically we did an analysis, a very very conservative analysis of how many species uh, uh, have become extinct on Earth, uh, vertebrate species, meaning mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fishes, in the last 500 and the last 100 years, and. What we found is like the species that were lost in the last 100 years, uh, if they were, uh, they should have been, they, they would have been lost in 10,000 years on their normal extinction rates. Meaning, if we, if we were not being part of the problem and having such a big impact on Earth, the species that become extinct in 100 years will probably have become extinct in 10,000 years. So, so we lost in 100 years a species that on the normal time, time, times will have been lost in 10,000 years. That's the uh, a huge impact on, on biodiversity. And as you say, we see every, every unfortunately, every two, three weeks, there is a more bad news. The, the uh, elephants collapsing because of the, of the illegal trade of ivory and bones to, to China and tigers and lions and jaguars and... I mean, the, the, the list of species is becoming endless. So, but, but what I would like to say here is like, uh, this is, can be very overwhelming, but what is a still good news, and I don't know if this will be good news for a long term, is that we can still do something. And, and I, what I will urge you, uh, our audience, is that we all can contribute to try to make this planet a safer for wildlife and plants, wildlife and plants, and, and uh, by doing that, by saving as much <coughs> as we can of plants and animals, wild plants and animals, we are doing a great favor to ourselves. Because every time that there are, every time we say prairie dogs, or we set aside a new protected area in Mexico, or we manage to uh, maintain and, and, and recover a species of endangered fish 
in the southwestern United States or the tigers in India or the elephants in Africa. The bottom line is that we really are doing a great favor to nature, but it's also where we're doing a great favor to us because this is the only way that we will be able to maintain the well-being of humans is maintaining nature that gives us so much for free. So I want to go back to – thank you for that. And I want to go back to, to prairie dogs and um, a few things. I, I wrote a few notes as you were talking. One of them is that there are – um, you said that they like to be able to see the horizon, and I was born in Nebraska, and there are tall grass prairies in Nebraska too. And I'm just curious, do prairie dogs like tall grass prairies too, or only short grass prairies? They, well, there are different species of prairie dogs, and, and, and usually they, they like both, but uh, um, when, when they are in good densities in, in tall grass, what they do is also they nibble the grasses and keep them at a certain height where they can see properly in the distance. And it's incredibly nice because if you will see some of the experiments that we did, there were areas where there were these mesquite scrubs coming up, really invading the, the, the grassland. And we will uh, reintroduce prairie dogs on those areas. Within one year, the area was free of uh, mesquites. And then uh, the grassland has been colonized, the grasses has colon have already colonized that area. So, so just imagine that you're a prairie dog you have many, many things that want to eat you, like uh, eagles, uh, coyotes, and so on, and, and, uh, and uh, you cannot see where they are coming from. And then you do something on your surroundings, and you see the, 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 the enemies properly, the, the predators properly coming. So, so they, they have really, really developed this uh, behavior to, to clear up the vegetation around their, 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 their habitat so they can see properly. So the next thing I wrote down – thank you for that. And the next thing I wrote down is that – I mean it's pretty obvious why prairie dogs um, uh, re-inhabiting a place would help coyotes, foxes, badgers, eagles, those who eat the prairie dogs. But you also mentioned amphibians and how how would prairie dogs – how do they help amphibians and how do they help some species that aren't – quite so obvious as they just eat the prairie dogs? That's a very, very good question and very good observation. Well, let's remember that in, in places in the grasslands, uh, basically there are few places to get refuge, I mean, to, to get cover, and uh, because there are few rocks and few logs and few holes. What prairie dogs do is they uh, create for uh, the refuge, I mean, they, they live in burrows, and they, th those burrows are, uh, can be incredibly abundant in, 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 a, in a prey dog colony. And those burrows provide a, a refuge to many species like uh, frogs, salamanders, uh, uh, rattlesnakes, and many species of invertebrates, lizards, um, scorpions, uh, uh, spiders, and so on. Uh, for two reasons. First of all, they provide them refuge. And second, the prey dog holes usually has a much pleasant uh, um, temperature and humidity than the place outside. In other words, because they are on the ground and they are uh, deep, they have a much, uh, they are much less affected by the changes in, in temperature during the day or during this, the year. And let's remember that prey dogs live in, in places where it can become really, really cold. So by being inside, the temperature is much uh, uh, less, less cold or less uh, hot in the summer than and also then by being uh, the refuge for many, many invertebrates and vertebrates, it also attracts, uh, I mean, those animals also are prey upon by other species. For instance, uh, uh, horned lizards, uh, uh, they live inside the burrows and they eat a lot of the crickets or spiders or uh, ants who live there. And rattlesnakes, they find out uh, also refuge there and they can eat some of the baby prey dogs or they can eat uh, uh, kangaroo rats or other animals living in the in the burrows. <laughs> so who would be one of the most surprising plants or animals who is uh, either dependent upon or helped by prairie dogs? So salamanders I found pretty surprising. Are there any plants or animals who are even more surprising? Well, that let, that's, let me tell, let me <coughs> tell you. <coughs> Sorry. Let me tell you that uh, the, the most in, one of the most endangered uh, mammals on Earth is the black-footed ferret. And the black-footed ferret, this is a whistle. 
that is has a, a, evolved, to evolve to feed almost exclusively on prairie dogs and to live exclusively in prairie dogs uh, colonies. So this animal is very long. It is uh, 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 the size of a, a small cat. And basically it lives uh, in the burrows of prey dogs. It feeds on the prey dogs and all his life cycle depends on prey dog colonies. So when the, the big collapse of the, of the prey dog colonies across the, 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 the continent causes that this species was declared extinct in the 1980s, uh, fortunately, a colony was found in in the U.S. and the uh, U.S. government started a, a, a captive breeding program that has been incredibly important to 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 save the species from extinction. And <coughs> let me tell you something else. Prey dogs, well, we have been working really hard to save them. Prey dogs and all the species associated to them, like the black-footed ferret, and we were doing really well until recently. We were doing really well because there were big colonies uh, uh, in Mexico and then in the US and so on, and uh, black-footed ferret uh, uh, in the wild were bouncing back from extinction and so on. But unfortunately, uh, there is a, a disease. Uh, the pest is a disease that uh, was introduced from Europe in the 1800s in, to, to, to the US. And it has been spreading from the east New York and those, uh, those regions to, to the West. And many of the colonies that we were able to, to recover and were doing really great uh, has been, uh, prey dog colonies has been susceptible to, to pests. And uh, some of the most important ones has collapsed uh, recently. We even in Mexico, we find out that the one uh, that we have been working lost more than half of, the, of their uh, size because of, of uh, what we believe is a, that disease. So is is that um, is that disease continuing to expand? It's expanding in territory, but are there uh, prairie dogs who are developing immunity to it, and the, the 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 towns are recovering, or are they are they is is this is well, this perhaps fatal? No, no. Well, it is. That's also a very good question. I mean, the disease is spreading to, towards the, uh, uh, the West uh, in the United States and towards Mexico. But uh, scientists have, uh, working, have been working in the last few years and developing a vaccine that can be provided in the food in pellets to the prairie dogs. And it has it's been proven very successful in two ways. On the one hand, to prevent that the plague will destroy the colonies uh, massively but also by, uh, uh, by providing uh, some safe heavens to, to some of the colonies and some of the animals who are developing some resistance to the disease. Uh, what I want to say pest is a plague also, we call it, they, they call them plague. And so you said early on that when you first saw that, uh, that prey dog community, it was the largest, um, I believe you said it was the largest in the world, but you use the word pa you use the past tense. So is yeah. that no longer the largest because of that plague? It used to be the largest when we discovered it. Then there was uh, some colonies in the U.S. here that recovered and were more or less a similar size. Then we have a big collapse in Mexico that we don't know. We still don't know it was plague or not. It just simply uh, from one year to the other, the, the lots of our colonies were long, lo lost. But now. Uh, our colony in Mexico, I think, is again the largest one because we have been doing a big efforts to, to, to promote it and uh, enhance it and uh, save it from the disease. And so, so for a while, it was the, the, the largest one, and then it was the th third or the fourth largest because some of the colonies in the USA have grown larger. But now, again, maybe so with one in the US is uh, uh, again the largest one left on Earth. You know, prairie dogs, the, the, the collapse of prairie dog populations by 98% um, is, for me, one of the signs of how, basically how terrible the dominant culture is because prairie dogs are so forgiving. I, I was born in Nebraska and grew up in Colorado, and so I saw prairie dogs all the time, and you will see prairie dogs 
on the median strip of interstates. They are not one of those species who has really, really specific habitat requirements. And if anything changes, they're not fragile is what I'm trying to say. And that both makes me really sad because if they can be reduced by 98%, that's a very bad sign. And on the other hand, their resilience gives me some um, – what tiny bit of optimism I have for the future comes from creatures like prairie dogs and salmon who are uh, so incredibly resilient. And if they're left alone, they can um, – they can improve the grasslands, or in the case of salmon, the forests, very, very quickly, and they can re-inhabit very quickly. Well, that's a very good observation because exactly, I mean, prey dogs probably will never become extinct as a species because they can survive in the smallest strips of land, even parking lots or in the middle of the highway and so on. But uh, what you do, what we find out there is that by losing the, pop the population, what we call the population extinction, is that uh, basically we're losing the ecosystem services that they provide when they have large colonies and large numbers. So in that sense, I think that, that is a, a incredibly important to understand that although they may not disappear because, as you say, they are incredibly noble creatures and they can adapt to survive in tiny places, by losing the big colonies, we're losing the real uh, role of a keystone species. On the other hand, uh, because they are rodents and they're adaptable and they are uh, 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 resilient, they can be brought back to, to the habitat. And with some management, we can uh, have hope that we can uh, get back colonies that could uh, be really, really large. And that's our goal. The world goal is that in the future, in the near future, we will be able to work between Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. and have a few hundred thousand uh, acres covered by prey dog colonies stretching again from Canada to Mexico. So I have I have three or four quick questions. We've got like three or four minutes left. One of them is you also mentioned microclimate. And when you said microclimate, how prairie dogs affect microclimate, did you mean microclimate within the burrow or do they actually affect the climate, the microclimate directly surrounding and above their their burrows? So it's both. We, they, they have a big impact on the microclimate of the boroughs, as we mentioned it. But also what we have found is that the uh, water infiltration, the humidity and other, other uh, uh, environmental uh, factors associated to uh, climate in, in the places where you have the prey dog grasslands are much more uh, better than in the uh, scrubland associated to the, the scrub that you got when you lost the, the prey dogs. And for instance, the microclimate, when you get the uh, prey dogs, the infiltration, to give you an idea, the infiltration, water infiltration of uh, uh, rainfall, it is much, much higher there than in the, in the scrub line. You know, I'm really smiling when you say that because there's a, I don't remember which indig indigenous nation it is, but there was a group of American Indians who say that, um, when the prey dogs are eradicated, then they say, who's going to bring the rain? But That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, there is more rain in places where there are prey dogs and there are more infiltration and the soils are more uh, fertile. I mean, it's a lot, a lot of, of, of interesting things going on there. I have a student who finished a master's degree recently, and she, what she did is compare the uh, ecosystem services provided by a prey dog uh, grassland and a mesquite scrubland associate, I mean, next to that. And uh, what we find out is like, it's incredibly important, soil fertility, soil uh, oxygenation, infiltration, soil depth, uh, and humidity, uh, relative humidity, and so on. So many, so many things are much, much uh, better in the prey dog towns and colonies than in the uh, grassland, in the mesquite scrubland that invade the grassland when the prey dogs are lost. Okay, that's great. And two more questions. One of them is, so if you could have the listeners to this interview 
take away one thing about prairie dogs that they know in their heart and it changes them and that so later in the evening or the next month they're saying wow i heard this great interview and they say what was it about and they give like what's the one or two sentences that you would like to encapsulate that they understand about prairie dogs what i would say is that prairie dogs are incredibly nice and interesting animals that are endangered with extinction because of our activities and that are critical to maintain the grasslands in southwestern the United States and Mexico. And then the last question, that's great. This is great. This whole interview is great. And the last question is, so if they, if somehow you are made the king of all things prairie dog and you, you can basically set whatever policies you want, specifically about prairie dogs, you can't, the rules are you can't reduce human population and you can't get rid of capitalism. So you can't make those larger structural changes, but specifically having to do with prairie dogs, what would you want to put in place? Well, what I would put in place is to escalate what we have found out in our experiments in Mexico, that we can couple uh, uh, development, cattle ranching, and so on in this uh, 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 prairie dog ecosystem, that we can couple them with development. What I will really say, to do that, you don't have to change the... Uh, social or the economic model, what you have to do is to implement on the ground what we have found and it works. I mean, what I, this is also very helpful. We don't have to change and to do many of the things to, that we have to, to, to do to say prey dogs on the one hand or biodiversity on the other hand, you don't have to change the whole social, political, or economic system. You have to make a, a, a changes and adapt it to what we're learning from science. Well, thank you so much for everything you, you've said, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Gerardo Ceballos. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.